Good afternoon, everyone. I think we're, we're ready to get started now. So thank you to those of you who signed in extra early for everyone that's, that's joining us uh, over the next minute or so, probably as well. Um, I'm Louise Durrant. I'll be chairing the session today that uh, Dr. Sarah Berry is kindly presenting. We also have Elaine Kennedy in the background. So any technical issues, any other sorts of issues or, or general comments and questions that crop up during the um, during the webinar, please feel free to pop them in the chat box and she's gonna keep an eye on those. There will also be lots of time for questions and answers at the end of, of the webinar. So you can pop those in the Q&A box as well. And myself and Elaine will work through those with Sarah at the end of, of the presentation. Um, we have around 200 people registered to join us today. So that's great. There are lots of ENLP alumni joining us, but also a lot of non-alumni so I hope you'll bear with me those who, who know a lot about the ENLP already but I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes talking about what the European Nutrition Leadership Platform who they are and, and what we do as well if my slides move on so the European Nutrition Leadership Platform or ENLP for short is the network of, of leaders in food and nutrition with a mission to train inspire and connect leaders in food and nutrition and one of the main activities that they do is run a seminar every year so they actually run two seminars one is called the ENLP essentials for young professionals and the other is called the ENLP advanced for mid to senior professionals this year they've obviously been virtual but hopefully by next year they can be face-to-face -face events again in Luxembourg so those who are interested in taking part in the future seminars Keep an eye on the ENLP website and social media for an announcement on when, um, when the opportunity to, to uh, apply comes up. But there is so much more than the seminars that are, are run as well. So there's a, a website that contains lots of information about the ENLP and other activity that's going on. There are lots of blog posts that go up on that website as well. Social media is quite active for, for the ENLP. So at ENLP underscore lead on Twitter. We also have local circle activities. So these are some countries have kind of groups of, of ENLP alumni that come together and run events. And they're not always events that are exclusive for alumni either. So those who haven't taken part can often join some of those events as well. And now we have webinars. So this is actually only our second webinar. We ran our first one in October last year. And this is now our second and, and hopefully they'll continue going forward as well. The first webinar we ran with Dr. Milka Sokolovic is now available to watch on the, the ENLP YouTube channel. And Sarah has kindly agreed to let us record this one as well. So it will be available to watch at a later date. So you can share it with colleagues and friends that, that didn't have the opportunity to join us live. So that a, a, will become a, a nice hub of all our webinars going forward. And just a very quick reminder for ENLP alumni, that we no longer have the listserv, which was our, our mailing list for sharing information between each other, but we now have the ENLP network and you will have been emailed about this. So do sign up and, and register to it so that you can keep in touch with the, the ENLP network. Before we start the webinar, I just have a couple of thanks to make, uh, to say, uh, mainly to the, the working group committee. So Elena, Helena, Elaine and Ellen, all the E's for me. Um, and they've put a lot of work into to putting together this webinar, our previous webinar, and obviously all our future webinars as well. So thank you to all of those for their hard work. And thank you to the ENLP sponsors who, you know, help us uh, run the, the seminars, but also help support activities like the webinars that we're running. And without further ado, I think we're almost ready to get started with today's webinar. Please do make use of social media, share your learnings on, on Twitter, use the hashtag ENLP webinar and tag at ENLP underscore lead. And also try and tag Sarah in it as well so she can see the lovely comments that you have to say as well. As I said, there'll be time for questions at the end. So please do pop your questions in the Q&A. Let's get started otherwise though. So Sarah is kindly, she's going to do an introduction herself. So I'm not going to waffle on for too much longer, but just to say Dr. Sarah Berry is a reader at King's College London in the UK. And she's going to talk to us today about the future of nutrition and a diet personalized to your metabolism. She's, done, she's been involved in some fantastic research projects in the UK. So I'm sure she's gonna share lots of learnings with us today. 
So Sarah, I shall hand over to you, give you the opportunity to share your screen. Fabulous, thank you. Um, thumbs up, you can see it, Louise? Yes, that's come up. Great. Fabulous. Um, so thank you firstly to ENLP for having me here. Um, just as we were joining, I was trying with Louise to remember when I uh, was uh, fortunate to do the NLP and uh, the, what I also call the test of endurance for those that have um, done ENLP. And I think it was about 15 or 16 years ago. Um, so it, it's lovely to still be involved as an alumni in this fantastic uh, programme. So as Louise said, I'm a reader in nutritional sciences at King's College London, where I've been for um, even a longer time than since I, I attended the NLP, so about uh, over 20 years now at King's. And my research has focused particularly on diet and cardiometabolic disease with real focus on postprandial metabolism. Um, and more recently, really trying to unravel the relative importance of the different determinants of postprandial metabolism, which is where I ventured into this whole new world of personalized uh, nutrition, which is what I'm gonna talk about uh, today. So um, I'm gonna talk about one of the really growing areas of the future of nutrition, which is a diet personalized to your metabolism. I'm gonna try and keep it quite broad at the start, but I'm gonna focus in using the PREDICT program of research, which I'll introduce in a little bit, as a way of illustrating what can be achieved um, and what the next steps uh, need to be. So the first and obvious question is, why do we actually need personalized approaches? And you know, as we all know that there's huge morbidity and mortality that's associated with dietary related um, risk factors. And this raises the question therefore, you know, why has global nutrition recommendations, which is based on very robust scientific evidence, failed to reduce the incidence of these dietary related chronic diseases? Is it that advice isn't working? Is it that advice is wrong? Is it that we're not following advice? And I think that's a, a, a question for a whole entire separate um, seminar. But what it does raise to us is the, the a one size fits all approach might not be the best answer and that precision nutrition might actually enable us to reduce some of these, uh, this burden of chronic disease. And the reason that I think this is so important is because we're really starting to understand just how complicated we are and food is. And we now know and have for some time that there's thousands and thousands of biological pathways that we all have that are all different you know, between each and every one of us. There's also thousands of different chemicals in each and every food within a very complex matrix that also modulates the impact of these chemicals. So if we throw together the complexity of food with the complexity of these individual biological pathways, it's apparent that we're all going to respond differently and to different ex extents of difference to the same food. And it really raises the question, therefore, how meaningful is the mean? And nutritional studies typically uh, have shown in the past the mean response, although I must you know, acknowledge that we're really moving away from this now. And I, I think many people are moving away from just showing the mean in their research. But if we look at what's typically been shown in the past would be a, a mean response following, let's say, a typical dietary intervention. So this is, um, to illustrate my point, this is a, a figure uh, from a, the diet fit study, which was conducted by my colleague, Christopher Gardner, where people were uh, uh, allocated to either a 12 month low fat or a 12 month low carb diet. And what he reported in his paper that there was no mean response between the individuals, this is 220 overall, between the over 100 individuals on the low fat or those on the low carb. But if we look at the individual responses here in this exact same study, which is shown by the, the, the figure on the right here, where each of these lines here shows an individual's change in weight following either up here the low fat diet or down here the low carb diet, you can see just how much inter individual variability there is. So how much variability there is between people and you can see how much 
that how big the difference is in the size. So the red line here shows the mean response, which is reported on the left here. And you can see for these people down here, their low fat diet or here, the low carb diet is hugely effective in weight change. But for these people in the middle, it has no impact. And I think this really nicely illustrates that how much variability there is between individuals and how a one size fits all approach doesn't work for everyone and how we need to move beyond the mean when we're looking at nutritional research, but also when we're considering the advice that we give to people. Now, this has been challenging because it's very difficult to look at high quality, precision and high quantity. And this is what's needed to look beyond the mean in nutritional research and when considering dietary uh, advice to individuals. So in the past, we've relied on either having very low quantity, but high quality and precision studies. So these would be our traditional randomized controlled trials using very um, uh, detailed, but very burdensome methods or we've relied on having very high quantity, but very low precision uh, studies, such as epidemiological studies, which involve less burden, but less um, granularity in the data. But we're really at exciting times, I think, in scientific, medical and nutritional research that we have these big data opportunities. And these come around from technological advances in the development of digital devices, so mobile phone apps that many of us have, clinical devices such as continuous glucose monitors, activity monitors from wearable technologies such as Apple Watches or Fitbits, for example. Also the development and expansion of remote clinical testing where we can actually at home remotely have our DNA measured, our microbiome measured, our blood tests, and these are from doing swabs, stool samples or dry blood spots, for example, that are then posted back. And also we mustn't forget this emerging area of citizen science more and more of us are becoming aware in the general population of the importance of diet and lifestyle in uh, maintaining health and longevity. And so many of us, um, as we use some of these digital devices or remote clinical testing, as part of this, we share back our data with the companies that do this or the researchers that are collecting the data, which allows us as citizens to actually be an active part of uh, future uh, science. And I think this is a really, therefore, an exciting time that we can capitalise on all of these developments and citizen science to really push the boundaries in nutritional research now. And this is exactly what we're doing in our PREDICT programme of research. This is the largest ongoing programme of research to measure individual responses to food and nutritional science. And I'm going to use this, like I said at the beginning, as a way of illustrating what's possible and the kind of things that also we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about precision nutrition and the things that we need to be a little bit cautious about and the things that really are pushing the boundaries and we should be very excited about. So just to give you some context um, about the PLIC programme of research, it's a collaboration between traditional nutritional academia led by King's College London, um, together with some other universities such as Stanford and Harvard and Tufts in, in the US, um, and a collaboration with a tech company. So the tech company is Zoe, which is a startup healthcare tech company formed specifically for the purpose of undertaking this PREDICT programme of research. And by combining nutritional academia with this startup tech company, it's really allowed us to push the fast forward button on nutritional research. And it's been a really exciting programme to be involved in over the last three years. So the PREDICT programme of research consists of three main PREDICT studies, PREDICT 1, PREDICT 2 and PREDICT 3. PREDICT 1 is what I'm going to focus on today. Um, if you do want to find out more about the PREDICT programme, you could visit the Join Zoe website and I've given the website uh, address down here at the bottom. And there's um, some science pages that talk you through each of uh, these different studies. What's common across all of these studies is all of these studies rely very heavily on remote clinical testing and the technologies we've talked about. So um, let's focus now on, on PREDICT1. So PREDICT1 used genetic, metabolomic, metagenomic and meal context information to predict individuals' with metabolic responses to food in order to answer three key questions. First, we wanted to look at how much variability is there between people. So how much variability is there between different individuals, but also within people. 
so also within a person day to day. Then what we wanted to do was look at what explains these differences. Why are we seeing this variability? Is it due to just the composition of the meal? Is it due to characteristics of the person, such as their age, sex, or BMI? Is it due to genetics, microbiome? Is it, or is it due to the context in which the meal is being consumed? So this means like time of day, when someone's done some exercise, how much sleep they've had. And lastly, can we take all of this information to predict individual responses to food using machine learning techniques? Now, something that's important to consider when we think about precision nutrition is that there's been huge amounts of research that's come before the PREDICT programme, before many of these other big studies uh, that are being launched uh, currently, looking at how individual exposures impact individual or, or maybe a group of different outcomes. And this has been hugely important work looking at underpinning mechanisms and also giving us an idea of what we need to focus on. But for precision nutrition to be effective, we really need to look at the integrated response. So we need to look at a whole host of outcomes. And we also need to really focus on the very different interrelated and multiple um, factors that determine how we respond to food. And we need to do that within the same study so we can look at the relative importance of these different factors. And so this is what we've done in the PREDICT study. We've tried to look at all of the different variables, so anthropometry, sex, food timing, sleep, exercise, etc., within the same study. The other thing that's really important to consider is how should we measure responses to food? Should we be looking at acute short-term changes or should we be looking at long-term chronic effects? And this is really important to consider as we know when we're planning any intervention study. Um, so apologies, let's take a step back. So we can think of either the postprandial or, or the long-term impacts. And something that we're particularly interested in with the PREDICT programme of research is considering the postprandial, so the short-term impact of food um, on our, our health. And so when we consume a mixed nutrient meal, <coughs> you have uh, an acute change in circulating metabolites, which is illustrated here. So you have a short, sharp rise in glucose, which is shown by the blue line here, peaking around 30 minutes, returning to baseline around two hours. And you have a more prolonged elevation in circulating blood fat, so blood triglycerides, peaking around four hours, returning to baseline around eight hours. And this is important because although traditionally uh, measures of disease risk have focused on fasting levels, so typically if you're are, are asked to go to the doctor, you're told, can you come in fasting so we can do a fasting glucose, we know that these excursions in circulating metabolites such as triglycerides and glucose from the nutrients in the meal initiate a cascade of downstream effects, which are mediated by other circulating metabolites, which ultimately result in increased unfavorable um, effects on, on factors such as inflammation, oxidative stress, um, uh, lipoprotein remodeling. And this is really important to consider because if we map this typical postprandial response um, onto a typical eating pattern where we consume multiple meals and multiple snacks throughout the day, it's evident that we spend very little time in this fasted state. So you can see that you have from your main meals and your snacks these multiple short shot rises in glucose, this prolonged elevation in triglycerides and the fat in the meal. And all of this is initiating these unfavorable health effects that I mentioned before from a single meal. And so something that we're particularly interested in is focusing on these acute responses to food as alongside the chronic responses. And this is because we're also recognizing in the field of nutritional research that many of these acute responses are actually what is what is underpinning obviously all of the chronic effects um, of food on health. So how did we do this? Well, we did this in a study which involved two cohorts. It had a main cohort in the UK, which was conducted at St. Thomas's Hospital. And then we had a validation cohort in the US consisting of 100 people at MGH. Um, it was a study that involved multiple test meal challenges. Um, it was a study that had both a clinic um, and a, a remote aspect to it. And I'm going to quickly just talk through uh, the protocol for the study so that we can move on to look at the results, but in the context of what we did. So with the PREDICT-1 study, we had participants attend uh, the clinical unit, fasted, 
when they tended the unit, we undertook a whole host of different measures. So we did a lot of collection of questionnaires for food frequency, lifestyle, medical. We looked at blood pressure, heart rate. We measured uh, uh, visceral body fat using DEXA scanning. We took a stool sample for the microbiome um, and uh, saliva and urine for metabolomics. We then took a faster blood sample from which we would measure uh, genetics and uh, clinical assays and metabolomics. Participants were then given a test meal, which consisted of 50 grams fat, 85 grams of carbohydrate to really kind of push the system. And then we took sequential blood samples over the following six hours with another second meal given at four hours to mimic a typical eating pattern. Participants then left our unit where fitted with wearable devices. So they had digital devices such as a continuous glucose monitor, a physical activity and sleep monitor. Um, they were also provided with uh, equipment for blood spot tests, uh, future stool sample collection, and they also had access to a special dietary assessment app. And what we did for the following 14 days is we followed our participants and participants consumed every morning fasted our standardized test meals after which we would monitor their glucose levels and they would also perform blood spot uh, dry tests for us to look at their triglycerides and see peptides as a surrogate for insulin. During this 14 day period, they logged absolutely everything they ate and drank. And this was monitored in real time by our team of nutritionists who using a dashboard could monitor exactly what they were um, inputting, allowing us to collect very high resolution data across a very large number um, of people, which is really important for dietary assessment. And so this study allowed us to collect both high resolution um, and also high, high scale data. And just to give you an idea of the scale of the data that we collected, um, it's shown here. So we had about 32,000 muffins, which are our standardized meals con consumed. We had 132,000 meals logged. We had 750,000 metabolomic measures, 2 million glucose readings, 28,000 tag readings from our dry blood spots, um, and an enormous amount of metagenomic reads for our microbiome analysis. And this created this huge data set from which we could start to unravel how much variability there was in individuals and what were the determinants or causes of this variability. So we published last year a paper in Nature Medicine showing how much variability there was uh, between um, individuals and the determinants of this, which can be found um, at the reference that's shown up here. And what you can see here is just how huge the variability is between individuals. So if I can show you for triglycerides, this shows the triglyceride concentration on the y-axis and the time across the x-axis over six hours. And this is from the clinic day data that was in this very tightly controlled clinic setting. The red and the blue line shows us the mean and the median response. And each individual black line here shows us an individual's uh, postprandial response. So each one of these is an individual from our thousand participants. And you can see for all of these individuals up here, the mean and the median just isn't very meaningful. What you can also see is that the variability is higher in this postprandial stage, so at the five to six hours compared to fasting, showing how valuable it is to look in this postprandial period, that it might actually allow us to disentangle and separate out people's uh, responses in a more sensitive way than just looking at the fasting value. And this is shown by the uh, coefficient of variation also, where it's uh, down here, where it's double, for example, um, at the six hours, the triglycerides versus baseline, and nearly times six uh, for the glucose response. Now, for precision nutrition to work, it's really important that the within individual variability is lower than the between individual variability, because if day-to-day -day variability is greater than between individuals, how can we offer that personalised advice. And so something that we were able to do with our study was look at this and compare inter and intra individual variability. And this is because the standardized test meals that we gave people that they consumed at home were all consumed in duplicate. So we gave them over that 14 day period test meals in the form of a muffin, which varied in the nutrient compositions, so the amount of fat, carbohydrate, protein and fiber. But each of these was given in duplicate. So what we could do is we could look at the, uh, which is plotted here, 
for each individual how their repeat compared, so how their response to the identical meal compared day to day. And to quantify this, we can take the uh, coefficient of variation, and you can see it down here on the bottom that the coefficient of variation is significantly lower, sorry, much lower between um, within an individual compared to between an individual, showing to us that the differences between individuals um, are, are largely repeatable within at an individual level. So what we wanted to do is look at what's causing these differences and is it all in our genes? Now, what we were fortunate is that the PREDICT study recruited mainly from the Twins UK cohort, which is a cohort led by Professor Tim Spector, who was leading the PREDICT uh, program of research. So about 70% of our 1,000 participants were identical or non-identical twins. And we could therefore determine how much and how important genetics was in determining how we responded uh, to our standardized meals. So what I've done here is I've plotted one identical twin against another identical twin. Now, if it was all due to our genetics as height is pretty much uh, primarily due to genetics, we'd have a beautiful straight line here when we plot one identical twin against another identical twin. But when we did this for both glucose and triglycerides postprandial concentrations, what you can see is it's all over the place. There's, we don't have this beautiful clear line showing that it's not all down to our genes. We're also able to quantify this using something called ACE heritability modeling. And this allows us to look at how much is due to genetics, how much is due to upbringing and how much is due to the environment. And what we saw is that for glucose, about 48% of our response is determined by genetics, but for triglycerides, hardly any of it was. Less than 1% was determined uh, by genetics. But importantly, this shows, although genetics made a reasonable contribution to our glucose response, genetics don't explain most nutritional differences and that it's not all predetermined in our genes. And I think as a nutritionist, this is really important because many people say, oh, well, it's all in our genes. You know, there's nothing we can do about how we respond to food or et cetera, or, or, or our health. But actually, I think this really nicely shows that there is a, a huge modifiable factor and that we do have the power to change how we respond to food. Okay, so we've seen it's not all due to our genetics. Well, what are the multiple determinants that are causing um, each and every individual variabilities uh, uh, response? So what we've been able to do with um, the PREDICT study, because we've collected so much data on the different exposures and the different outcomes, we've been able to, in this single study, look at all of these different exposures, such as meal composition, meal context, genetics, microbiome, um, et cetera, and look at how these impact some of these intermediary measures, such as triglycerides and glucose, and also some of these downstream health outcomes. And I'm just going to go through a few of these just to give you a flavour. There isn't time in this talk to delve into each and every one of these. In summary, before I do, what we found is that what we eat, how we eat, and who we are all impact how we respond to food. And they all play quite an equal role in how we respond to food. So if we think a little bit about how we eat, so something that has been focused on previously over the last, say, 10 to 15 years is in nutritional research is looking at chrononutrition, circadian rhythm. How does time of day influence our response? And this is something we wanted to look at, but again, looking at it in terms of how important is it in, in relation to all of these other variables. So what we were able to do is firstly, we looked in the whole population and we found, as we would expect, that people's postprandial glycemic response, which is what is shown here, following a breakfast was a lot lower than following the same meal when it was given at lunch. This is the glucose two hour error on the curve. And this is nothing that new. But what we've wanted to do is look at, is this the case for everyone? And we found firstly, no, it's not the case for everyone. And what we wanted to do then is look at, well, who is more predisposed to having this um, a, a, a impact at time of day and who is less predisposed? And we can look at an individual level, but we can also look at it in a stratified way. And this is what I've shown here. So what we did was we separated out people according to their age groups, which is shown down here. 
And then you've got the, again, the gluca glucose um, two hour area under the curve. And we've got in blue, the breakfast response, and then in gray, the lunch response. And what you can see here is in young individuals, say less than 60, you see this huge difference in the lunch versus the breakfast response. But once you hit about 60, you're not seeing such a big impact of time of day, showing that actually, therefore, maybe we need to stratify our advice, that if we're suggesting to people to front load, load their cards, we only do this for a certain age group and we don't worry about it you know, above a certain age. The other thing that we've been looking at a lot and we need to consider again, you know, because there's so many different factors that are determining how we respond and how the actual, uh, how we eat impacts our responses to food is meal ordering, for example. So something that we were able to do as one of our sub studies was to look at how does what we have for breakfast impact what we have, the response that we have uh, following a uh, lunch meal. So this was in our predict carb study and we gave everyone a randomized order, different breakfasts. And then what we did is four hours later, we gave everyone an exactly the same lunch meal. And what we found was that people's responses to their lunch meal was actually largely influenced by, their, by what they had at breakfast, showing again the complexity of the different variables that we need to think about when we're trying to understand responses to food and also give advice to people. Now, I've only touching on a couple of things about how we really just to give you a flavour of the sort of work we've been doing. You can read up on more of this in detail in our, our nature um, uh, uh, papers. Something else I want to mention is that's very important, as many of you all know, is that we need to consider very carefully what features of the response we're also going to measure. And this doesn't apply just to postprandial, but also, as you'll know, with all um, our outcomes that we're thinking about when we look at how we respond to food. And from a postprandial perspective, there's very typical measures that are typically used, such as two hour air under the curve. But actually, our postprandial response curve is very complex. We could look at the peak concentration. We could look at the duration of the um, uh, elevation. We could look at the dips in the glucose, et cetera. And this is something, again, that we've been doing with our PREDICT program with research, is trying to look at which features should, should we be looking at that are relevant to different outcomes. And so, for example, with triglycerides, we know that an elevated response at six hours is particularly important if we're thinking about postprandial inflammation. And something that we delved quite deeply in, and we recently published a couple of weeks ago, was to actually go and explore a little bit about the glucose dips and how the dipping glucose, so this is the dip that you typically get between about two to four hours after having quite a high carb meal, how that might impact different outcomes. So firstly, what we looked at was who, who, who are dippers, how many people dip, do we all dip and do we all have the same uh, level of dip? And so the frequency of the dips is shown here and you can see huge variability. Anyone uh, to the right of this dotted line shows that they dip and this shows the size of their dip. And so you can see that a large proportion of people do exhibit a dip following our standardized test meal between two to four hours in their glucose concentration and that there's huge variability in the, the size of the dip between individuals. We then compared these people that have this big dip with the people that aren't exhibiting a dip. And we looked at how this corresponds to their reported change in hunger, alertness, time till they consume their next meal and the calories that they consume. And we found that people that have a bigger dip had a greater increase in hunger, a greater impairment in alertness, and consumed their next meal about 30 minutes earlier than those that had no dip. We also found that they consumed about um, 100 more calories at their next meal, and that actually over the entire 24-hour period, they consumed about 300 more calories than people that didn't ex exhibit dips. And we didn't see the same relationship when we took the typically traditionally used uh, feature of, of glucose response, which was a two hour air under the curve. We only saw this when we measured the dips, which is really to illustrate to you how, again, we need to be not just for precision nutrition, but thinking very specifically about what feature we're interested in in relation to which outcome. 
So let's take a step back to where we were a few minutes ago. We've seen that what we, how we eat is really important. We know that what we eat is important. We know that who we are is important. And something else that we've taken quite a deep dive into with our work is to look at how the microbiome also affects our outcomes, which is partly about who we are, because it's our own uh, uh, microbiome composition. As a quick recap, the microbiome is 100 trillion different microorganisms that exist in our, our tra uh, gastrointestinal tract. And if you want a good review to see just how important it is in terms of both health and disease and all of the variables shown here, there's a great review by my colleague Anna Valdez, um, the reference here. And we recently published some research that I think really nicely highlights the very complex interplay that exists between the gut microbiome, the food that we eat, and our health. I'm going to show you a couple of slides just to highlight um, these results. So firstly, what we looked at was how variable our microbiome is. Um, we found that um, in unrelated individuals, we shared, people shared about 30% of their gut microbes, and that in twins, they shared about 34%. So there was only a very small increase in the number of microbes shared by twins versus unrelated individuals, again, reinforcing the message that I mentioned earlier about how genetics isn't really the be all and end all, isn't the primary determinant of not only our responses to food, but also, as you can see here, our microbiome composition. We also wanted to look at is the food, the microbiome linked to the food that we eat. And we looked at this across different levels, which is really important in nutritional research. We looked at nutrients, we looked at foods, we looked at food groups, and we looked at dietary patterns. And we identified different foods and dietary patterns that were more closely associated with the microbiome than others. But really importantly, what we were able to do is we were able to look at individual microbes, which some are shown here, and individual foods. And I, I've just kind of picked out a few to illustrate the point. And we started to see a clear segregation in unhealthy foods and healthy foods with different micro, microbes, which we have loosely called these good bugs and bad bugs. And so we saw this very clear grouping of foods such as uh, chocolate confectionery, processed meats, positively associated with these bugs here and negatively associated with these, and the inverse was the case for healthy foods. We also looked at how these associated with health outcomes. Um, and this slide is a little bit complicated. It's taken straight from the paper, but it's really just to illustrate again the segregation that we start to see. So we started to see the same bad bugs that we identified in the previous slide and the same good bugs that we identified in the previous slide associated with specific health measures. So for example, with blood pressure, we see this very clear association here with these good bugs and, and, uh, and um, uh, ne negative association with the, sorry, with the bad bugs. Um, and the same with, for example, the inflammatory measures that they're uh, negatively associated with the good bugs and positively associated with the bad bugs. What we also looked at is how is the microbiome related to our postprandial responses that we've been so interested in? And we know from work done by a group in Israel, um, Aaron Segal's group, that gut microbiome is related to blood sugar responses. But what we also found for the first time is that the microbiome composition plays a really important role in its association with blood fat responses. And we found a really high correlation between the microbiome and our blood postprandial triglyceride response. But I think in summary, what this microbiome uh, research as part of PREDICT enabled us to do was develop this microbiome signature where we have this cluster of good bugs, this cluster of bad bugs that are associated with healthy measures of health and diet. So it's looking at both health and diet within the same study. But this raises the question to us, can we personalise the microbiome and can we elicit changes in health? So this work that I've shown you on the microbiome is cross-sectional work. It's not showing causality. What we need to do next is we need to look at can we change the microbiome through diet, through these um, healthy associations that we've seen, and can that elicit changes in these um, uh, health outcomes that we've also seen this association with? 
So I think this really leads us nicely on to what do we do with all of this data then? How can we use this to actually be useful to us? And how can we build on data that's been previously collected again to be useful to precision nutrition? And this brings us back to what I said at the beginning, that we need to look at all of these interrelated factors and we need to look at how their relative importance in how they impact our health and also the different health outcomes we're interested in. So what we um, have been able to do is take all of this data, look at the multiple exposures and look at the relative impact dependent upon the specific outcome that we're interested in. And so we've shown here the different variables and their relative ranking of impact that they have on postprandial triglycerides here on the left or postprandial glucose on the right. And what's important to note is the different exposures have a different ranking. So for example, meal composition and genetics is important for determining postprandial glucose responses, yet it's our baseline um, uh, lipids and triglycerides and habitual diet that are more important in determining postprandial triglyceride responses. And again, this is important in precision nutrition because if dependent on what particular outcome we want to focus on, will then help us decide what particular exposure we might want to modify for that particular individual person. And what we've also been able to do is take all of this data, use AI and machine learning techniques to predict individual responses. Um, and this is shown here. So because we had a primary cohort and then a validation cohort, we were able to build a prediction um, uh, algorithm. And you can see here the measured glucose up against our predicted uh, glucose using our algorithm. And we can see a correlation of around 77%, which is actually very good to show that with, we can predict with about 77% accuracy someone's um, glucose response using our various input variables. And so I want to finish really by leaving you all with the thought and we can discuss this as to what's the future for personalised nutrition. So if we take a step back, I've shown you that we can use all of this new technology, such as digital devices, remote testing, to uh, really advance the data that we're collecting. We can use microbiome data, DNA data, but we need to make sure we use it in this very holistic, in this integrated way. We need to be very careful using microbiome only or DNA um, uh, only testing. And I hope some of this, the flavour of the work that I've shown you has given you kind of some understanding for how we must look at this very integrated response in these multiple determinants. But once we've found all of this, once we've established what causes um, our, our yeah, differences in how we respond to food, how can we use this to impact health? And it raises really important questions such as does personalised advice actually outperform? standardised advice? Is it going to be useful? And I would point you to the Food for Me programme, which is a fantastic programme of EU research that I think really addresses this quite well. And it does show that personalised advice does outperform standardised advice. But I think we need to be mindful of where population-based guidelines fit with all this and what the prospects are at an individual level. And I think, you know, a key, as we know, to all of this is once we have this information, how do we actually go about affecting change in people and how do we make this available to population level um, and accessible uh, to all? So lastly, I'd just like to acknowledge a fantastic team of people that have worked with us um, on this programme of research um, across King, Zoe um, and the various academic institutes that we've uh, been working with over the last few years. Um, if you want to follow any of the updates on our research, I always post them on my uh, Twitter, which my handle's here, um, and I'd be very happy to take questions from you now. Thank you, Louise. Thank you ever so much, Sarah. We have had a couple of questions submitted, so we will get to those in a second, but I just wanted to, to kind of touch on how interesting I thought your, your presentation was and what an incredible data set you had from just a predict one, so I can't imagine the amount of data that you've all collected over all of the studies that you've got. So thank you for, for talking to us about the, just that one study. Um, I also really like the line 
he said towards the start about using personalised or pre precision nutrition to push the boundaries of nutrition research. And I think that is so relevant. It's sometimes seen as quite a controversial topic, but we do need to push those boundaries in nutrition research to find out if it's something that we can apply um, across kind of, you know, dietary interventions and, and um, things going forward. So it's it's really interesting area. Um, I've got a couple of questions that I will start with. Elaine might chip in um, a few more later on, but my first question is, how can advancements in nu nutrigenomics better inform public health nutrition interventions? I know you touched on it a little bit, but do you think there's certain things in um, public health nutrition interventions that can start to be implemented? Um, my personal opinion is that, um, and I hope the data has shown this, that because it's not all about genetics, we need to be very careful, particularly for public health interventions. I think there's some very specific um genetic variants that obviously where it is important but this is only in a very small proportion of the population and i would just repeat which i know i've said throughout the talk that we need to consider all of the different variables when we're looking at population level um advice and i don't think we're currently yet at a, a, a stage to be um implementing uh, new genetics at a population level so that leads on to the next question what do you see as the most pressing research need in the field? Oh gosh. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that we need to be continuing these large scale studies where we can look at the integrated responses. Um, and I think that a lot more work needs to be done on how we eat. So the importance of the context in which we're eating our food um, I also think that a really pressing area of research is around the food matrix. And I think that, you know, many of us in nutritional research are moving beyond that very reductionist approach of looking at nutrients and looking at food matrix. You know, and, and this really highlights the importance of, you know, moving away from ultra processed foods, for example. If we knew what we now know about the importance of the matrix and the original structure of the food, would we have been more resistant to this explosion in the consumption of uh, processed foods currently um, internationally. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Um, a similar question, and, and we can probably predict your answer to it, but what do you think about current DNA tests that are accessible to people um, and that kind of claim that they might be able to give you some advice to, to improve your, your nutritional intake, to improve your overall health? Um, I think that they need to be taken with a little bit of a pinch of salt. I think that it would, it concerns me that people might be uh, transforming their diet based purely on what they believe are, um, you know, ba based on their belief that it's all predetermined by their genes. And I just think what's out there on the market in terms of genetic testing um, and its application for precision nutrition at an individual level, I don't think it's, um, at, at a stage yet that can offer that precision advice. And I think personally, I think they're a little bit of a waste of money, I'm afraid. <laughs> Don't shoot I'll me down. <laughs> no, that's all right. I'll hand you over to Elaine in a moment. I've just got one question from myself and that's how has it been working alongside a tech company? Exhausting, but wonderful. It's been incredible. Um, you know, after 20 something years in academia, I, I said at the beginning, it's like pushing the fast forward on nutritional research. The pace um, that things are done at is so exciting. And working with people that can handle this kind of data that can in real time um, look at what's happening with the data so that we can adapt protocols as we're running studies is really exciting and this is exactly what we're doing in PREDICT3. So PREDICT3 is an ongoing study. Um, we currently have about 4,000 people completed. We hope to have 10,000 in a matter of months and you know in, in real time the data is being analysed. We see interesting findings thrown up. We can then in real time adapt the protocol or insert many kind of testing protocols within that um, you know, something that we're really interested in that the data has shown is around the order in which you actually consume the foods within a meal. So what you have for, let's say, a starter versus what you have for main course. 
And so we've been able to implement something very quickly to, to explore that. And that's what's been super exciting is to be able to do it at that pace because they have that very specialist AI expertise to be able to take the data, get the findings, feed it back. Yeah, certainly makes a change from academia, I think, sometimes. Well, you know, in, we, we're, we're nutritional scientists. We're not, um, we can't do everything. And I think this is something that I often say to talk about with my colleagues that my expertise is in the design and implementation of studies and in understanding postprandial metabolism. My expertise is in, in this very complex AI. And this is where, you know, the predict study has really shown how trying to pull on other expertise outside of academia has been incredibly fortunate. Brilliant. I think Elaine probably has a, a couple of questions to ask. Yeah, we've actually had quite a few questions coming in, so I'll just get straight into it, Sarah. So firstly, um, in the blood glucose dip study, did you also analyze the data using blood glucose dips as a continuous predictor? Um, no, we looked at the data by separating out the top and bottom quartiles um, and using it categorically. Okay, and then when evaluating the nutritional biomarkers in epidemiology as well as in the clinic, sorry now, <laughs> it is common practice to distinguish between the fasting and the non-fasting state, commonly defined as six to eight hours since the last meal. What is your opinion on this approach and do we have better options? Um, so I know that that's typically, um, uh, like you say, how it's um, classified. <laughs> you know, it, it's very difficult, I think, in, or it has been very difficult to collect postprandial samples. And I think what we need to do is make sure we have very specific data on the timing since the previous meal and the composition of the previous meal in these data sets. I think fasting, as long as it's more than a 12 hour period and we have details on what has been consumed before, um, you know, it is perfectly fine in terms of time frame. But I think what's really important is to consider the importance of maybe trying to collect specific time points of postprandial samples. It's not incredibly valuable to collect postprandial samples across a quite a range of times if we don't have it specified. We know how dynamic the curve is and we know that, for example, like we've shown with the glucose, it's the dip that's important for this outcome, yet it's the peak in glucose that's important for inflammation. It's the six hour rise for triglycerides that's important for certain inflammatory measures, yet it's the overall response that's important for you know, our other measures. And so I think if we are going to collect non-fasting samples, we need to know what was consumed for the meal before that and what is the time frame since consumption of that meal for us to really be able to make meaningful extrapolations. And because previously we've not been able to um, uh, collect fast uh, postprandial blood samples in a very structured, um, you know, robust way, um, I think this is a new consideration now that we can use continuous glucose monitoring, now that we can use techniques such as dry blood spots to measure many different metabolites, that hopefully going forward it's something that we're going to be thinking about a little bit more. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. And then just the next point is, and I think you kind of touched on a little bit as well, it's how does the precision nutrition fit into the obesogenic environment saturated with ultra-processed foods and drinks? Might it help to detect the problems that high fructose corn, um, syrup and ultra-processed foods and drink can cause at a metabolic level early enough to intervene at the individual level as well as to help shape policy um, and protect public health? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're kind of almost fighting a losing battle with the food environment that we're, we're currently in. And I don't really have a, a good answer to the question that you posed. I think that it's something that, you know, it is the biggest challenge beyond any challenge that we face is the, the food that many of us have access to, the food that may be um, important to us, whether it's culturally, emotionally, socially, um, and, um, this very obesogenic environment and the ultra processed food where like I said earlier where the food matrix is destroyed um, I think makes it a, a, a real challenge. I haven't really addressed that um, I, I don't think but I think it's it's just to say I agree it, the you know we need to be moving away from ultra processed foods as much as we can you know regardless of a precision nutrition approach. I think that the next question nearly kind of touches on this point is, is the complexity of the issue. 
it's um this, this person's asking can you elaborate on the applicability of personalized nutrition especially in terms of how much data is required for providing a good prediction obviously in the study a, quite a, an intense protocol was used which might not be feasible in real life yeah i mean i think that's a, a good point because it raises the issue about accessibility of personalized nutrition for everyone and whilst we're developing these prediction algorithms and whilst we're unraveling the um, different exposures and they, the, their impact on our different outcomes, we need this very high resolution, high scale and high breadth of data. The ultimate goal though is to be able to obtain so much data that we can actually really filter down to what are the key things that we really need to measure. And what we hope is that by you know, getting to the tens, hundreds of thousands, that we might be able to actually say, okay, for your age, your sex, your BMI, your, you know, um, maybe one, you might need one basic, um, you know, blood marker, that our wealth of data shows that these are the best kind of foods uh, for your unique biology. And that would be the ultimate goal, that we can therefore make it accessible uh, to all without having a whole battery of tests. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. The other questions that have come in here are, firstly, how long did it take to conduct the PREDICT1 and to process all the data? Um, so we conducted PREDICT1 within 10 months um, when um, having run postprandial studies for the last 20 years, where normally it would take me a year to get through about 25 people uh, with repeat testing. I was shocked when it was suggested to me that we could do this in under a year, um, but it was achieved. Um, partly because we had this fantastic Twins UK cohort that were an ongoing cohort. In terms of processing the data, we're still processing it. And this is because um, we've also got our other ongoing studies as and when we unravel uh, you know, new research findings, we're then uh, uh, focusing on other um, work. But all in all, from starting the study to the key main findings, it was about a year and a half, which from my experience in nutritional research was quite phenomenal. It is actually incredible to, to think that that amount of data was processed in that time. Um, there's just a question here, did you get to measure pancreatic beta cell function or insulin secretion? No, so um, we have uh, undertaken a small sub-study called Predict Cardio where we have um, looked at um, pancreatic um, and liver fat uh, to, to start kind of looking more deep phenotyping. We have measured glucose um, and insu insulin responses um, following uh, the clinic test meals. So we can look at our quickie, et cetera, um, as a kind of surrogate for that. Okay, thanks. We have quite a few questions here, but Louise, I'm just conscious of time. We've just gone to one o'clock there. So I was just going to say, we'll probably wrap up. I think, um, yeah. I know, Sarah, you shared your, your Twitter and your contact details. So if people have a, a pressing question, I'm sure you're happy for them to reach out to you. But otherwise, I think we'll, we'll probably wrap up and say, firstly, a huge thank you to Dr. Sarah Berry for joining us and for, for giving this presentation. It's been really interesting. And I think one question that we had, which we won't ask, but it just shows how, how much people are interested in this topic is that someone's asked if you have any PhD or postdoc opportunities coming up. So obviously people like the, the research field and, and want to get involved in it themselves. But, so thank you ever so much, Sarah, for your time. To thank everyone you. else, thank you for joining us. At the end, when we end it, there will be a short survey, just a, an evaluation survey. We'd be grateful for any feedback. And we will announce the next webinar in the coming weeks. So keep an eye on, on social media. Again, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everyone that's joined. And I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.